Welcome to Lincoln Log, where we speak with leading historians and other officials about their stories, research, and wisdom. Expand your knowledge and indulge your curiosity here on Lincoln Log. This podcast is produced by the Abraham Lincoln Association, aiding and promoting Abraham Lincoln's life and legacy. Founded in 1908, the ALA remains the nation's oldest and largest Lincoln organization. Learn more at abrahamlincolnassociation.org. Greetings. I am your host, Joshua Claiborne, and I am pleased to welcome Professor Michael Burlingham to our Lincoln Log podcast. Michael is the Naomi B. Lynn Distinguished Chair in Lincoln Studies at the University of Illinois Springfield. He studied history at Princeton University under renowned Lincoln scholar David Herbert Donald, and then followed Donald to John Ho- Johns Hopkins University, where he earned a PhD. After teaching history at Connecticut College in New London from 1968 to 2001, Michael joined the faculty of the University of Illinois at Springfield in 2009, where he remains today. His works are far too numerous, numerous to list here, but we must take particular no- note of the popular two-volume biography titled Abraham Lincoln, A Life, published in 2008. That biography, affectionately called The Green Monster, won the 2010 Lincoln Prize and may be the very best Lincoln biography of the modern era, if not of all time. Michael is a board member and founder of the Abraham Lincoln Institute and board member and president of the Abraham Lincoln Association, which produces this podcast. His work in this field is so renowned that many scholars believe no other living human knows more about Abraham Lincoln than Michael Burlingham. So as you can imagine, he is a perfect guest for the Lincoln Log podcast. Michael, welcome. Thank you, Josh, and thank you for that very kind introduction. Well, I certainly want to delve into Abraham Lincoln and your scholarship on the man, but I'd like to begin with this question. What first prompted your interest in history generally, and what do you see as the spark that lit your fire for history? Uh, Well, uh, in part because uh, I seem to have had something of a knack Uh, when I was in school. That's the subject that most interested me, uh, and which I did best, Um, and also uh, what interested me in, in the Civil War in Lincoln in particular, I think is uh, partly because I grew up in Washington, D.C. This was just slightly after the unfortunate event at Ford's Theater. Um, but I was able to see as a kid the Lincoln Memorial, the Ford's Theater, the Capitol, Washington, uh, 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 the, the whole environment of Washington, picnics at Manassas, uh, all that sort of thing. Um, and then in addition, uh, some of my ancestors uh, were of more than routine interest. Uh, my great-grandfather's cousin, for example, was Anston Burlingame, who was a Massachusetts anti-slavery congressman who was appointed to be minister to China by Lincoln. Uh, and his father, Joel Burlingame, was a delegate to the 1860 Republican National Convention in Chicago and voted for Lincoln and was on the committee that went from Chicago to Springfield to announce to Lincoln formally that he had received the nomination. Uh, Then uh, I had a great grandfather who was a veteran of the Union Army and was captured at Petersburg and incarcerated at Andersonville and managed to survive. Uh, And then there's some spooky connections that I have with Lincoln. Uh, Many years ago, I learned for the first time that Robert Todd Lincoln was not buried with his father and mother and brothers in Springfield, but instead in Arlington National Cemetery. So I went over and visited that site and was astounded to see that the grave of Robert Todd Lincoln is about 200 yards from my parents. Uh, Well, that's spooky. Uh, And then when I visited the tombs of Lincoln's father and his stepmother uh, outside Charleston, Illinois, uh, I was impressed by the large stones marking their grave sites. There were a bunch of little tombstones nearby, and I read the inscriptions on some of them, and one of them said Leander Burlingame. Hmm. And I thought, hmm, that's an unusual name, so a little poking around. And uh, lo and behold, Leander Burlingame was a carpenter uh, who lived in the same area as Thomas Lincoln, Lincoln's father. And according to the sources that I found, uh, Leander Burlingame made the coffin Hmm. in which Thomas Lincoln is buried. 
Now, some people have said that's sort of like my book, which doesn't have a particularly <laughs> <laughs> portrait of, of Thomas Lincoln. Um, but I think all those things contributed. But the most dramatic episode, uh, which I think predisposed me to become a historian, was my experience as a college freshman. Uh, this was 1960, 61. And I had uh, a Civil War course with David Donald. Uh, and he had just won the Pulitzer Prize, the, the first of his two Pulitzer Prizes for a biography of the very prominent uh, senator during the Civil War era, Charles Sumner. Uh, and uh, he uh, had a, a large number of students because it was the, uh, it was the centennial, the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861. Uh, and this was his first year at Princeton, as it was mine. And so I took his course, but there were at least 100 students. And so we had two big lectures a week where he held forth for 50 minutes. And then we would have one small class discussion group, which is rather grandly called a preceptorial at Princeton. And uh, so he had so many students uh, in his lecture hall uh, that he couldn't have uh, all of the small class discussion groups. So I was assigned to somebody else uh, who turned out to be a historian of early modern Europe. Hmm. And so I sat in that first precept and thought, hmm, this won't do. And uh, just went into one of Professor Donald's precepts and just lied through my teeth, said, sir, this is the only one that fits into my schedule. <laughs> and said, sure, come on in. <laughs> and so, uh, so I sat in, and so we reread a book a week uh, and I would come in and talk with him and, and I, um, and, and the other students, but I was usually the one who had actually done the reading. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, so it was like a tutorial. And one of the books was Benjamin Thomas's biography of Abraham Lincoln, which to my way of thinking, and, and still in the year 2020, um, is still the best biography, but best uh, single volume biography of, of Lincoln. It's beautifully written and, he, and Benjamin Thomas has a wonderful empathy for Lincoln. He really can put himself in his shoes and bring him to life in a kind of three-dimensional uh, technicolor way, which, which is an enviable quality in a biographer. Um, and so, um, uh, and then David Donald took me under his wing. I couldn't believe it. Uh, he, he made me his research assistant, which, which in those days you had to be at least a junior or a senior to have that scholarship mm -hmm. job. Uh, and there I was as a, as a pimply 20 year old <laughs> I mean, doing research for the man who just won the Pulitzer Prize working on this second volume of the uh, book that won uh, the Pulitzer Prize for volume one. So I thought, my goodness. And then when he left Princeton after my sophomore year, I stayed on and finished up uh, in New Jersey and then followed him down to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, where I pursued my PhD and got it under his direction and uh, his tutelage. Um, and if he had been a medievalist, I would probably be writing about the Middle Ages today. So uh, I think it was, it was his uh, influence uh, as much as anything that predisposed me to, to be a historian and be particularly to be uh, a Lincoln scholar. Mm. And so when you began in the collegiate field, you, you, Lincoln was really a focus from the very beginning in, in your mind, uh, well, in terms I, of what I, you I, studied. Right. I didn't do my doctoral dissertation on Lincoln uh, himself, but I did, did a, a dissertation on Carl Schurz, who was a leading German-American Republican uh, political figure, orator, uh, champion of the anti-slavery cause, mm -hmm. in part because I had a summer job at the Library of Congress between my junior and senior years in college uh, in the manuscript division, processing manuscript collections which was a very heady experience because there I was, again, an undergraduate, and I was asked to help rearrange papers of prominent figures in the Civil War era. Uh, and the Carl Schurz papers uh, uh, occupied my attention for uh, two of the three months that summer. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the Schurz family had devoted, uh, they, they had donated, his papers uh, early in the 20th century, um, but they had withheld what they thought were uh, strictly personal papers which would be of no interest to the larger scholarly community. But of course, the letters that he wrote to his wife when he was away from home, when he was serving in the Senate, when he was campaigning for Lincoln, and all that, those letters were extremely valuable. Yeah. Uh, 
And uh, there I was <laughs> rearranging these and nobody had seen them except his wife. <laughs> now they were in German, um, and, and an old fashioned German handwriting, which was a little hard to, to decipher. But I did, I did get somebody to help decipher them. Uh, and there's this remarkable new information about Lincoln. Um, and uh, so I did my senior thesis at Princeton on, on Schwartz. And then Schwartz became, after the war, became a senator from Missouri and was a close ally of Charles Sumner. So I thought, my goodness, if I do my doctoral dissertation, then uh, I can do research which would help Professor Donald. Um, right. Because sure, some, and, and I'll be dealing with a lot of German sources, which you might not ordinary see, ordinarily see. Um, and so, uh, and, and so it, it dealt with Lincoln because it dealt with Schwartz's career uh, during the um, 1850s and 1860s. Um, so, uh, hmm. uh, uh, and then, then I started teaching at Connecticut College in New London. And when I began teaching there in 1968, it was known as Connecticut College for Women. Uh, and I went co-ed the following year and is now just known as, as Connecticut College. Uh, and so, um, and it didn't emphasize scholarship. Uh, you're expected to do a lot of teaching in a small liberal arts college and teach a lot of different courses. And, and there was very little emphasis, at least in those days, some, some time ago on publication. And so I was pretty sidetracked um, from pursuing uh, intensive scholarly research and publishing. Mm -hmm. um, but after a while, uh, I, I felt the itch to get back to it. Um, and uh, just a, a message came to me uh, from out of the blue saying, write a book on Lincoln. And I said, well, okay, to, talking to the uh, urge, uh, uh, what, what shall I focus on? And he said, just read the collected works and you'll find out. And of course, I had known the Lincoln's more famous uh, letters and speeches mm -hmm. and proclamations and the like, but I'd never sat down and gone through the collected works that had been published by the Abraham Lincoln Association in eight volumes uh, back in the 1950s. And as I went through it, uh, a series of, of topics just leapt off the page that uh, seemed to me to cry out for more intense coverage than uh, I was aware had been uh, undertaken. Mm. And I was particularly interested in a psychological approach uh, to history. I am, a, I am something of a psycho-historian. That, by the way, is one word. Uh, <laughs> there are psycho-historians, uh, two yeah. words. I flatter myself that I do not belong to that category, although not everybody I know would necessarily agree with that assessment, but uh, in any event. And so um, I, I picked the nine topics occurred to me. Uh, his Lincoln's relationship with his parents, with his children, with his wife, um, his depressions, uh, his midlife crisis, his anger, um, all that sort of thing. And, and that really led to the inner world of Lincoln, which that's right. You, that led to my first book uh, in 1994, which, which which came out much after I, I had gotten my PhD. I was uh -huh. I'm very much a late bloomer. Um, mm -hmm. and most most people do a dissertation, then they work that into a book, and then that's that leads to another book, and so on. Um, but I, uh, I got a late start in the publishing world, and I've been doing my best to try to make up for it since then. Um, and um, anyhow, so uh, I was, uh, I was at the, in New London, Connecticut, uh, and I drafted that book uh, based on published sources. Uh, that is, books and articles that uh, were in the college library or could be obtained through interlibrary loan. And so I, I knew the published sources pretty well, and I had a draft of, of each of those nine chapters. And I said, well, okay, now it's time to do a little uh, original research that is uh, in unpublished sources. Now, if you can't be in Washington, D.C. to do research, or in uh, Springfield, Illinois, to do Lincoln research, the next best place, arguably, is Providence, Rhode Island, which is the home of Brown University, and the John Hay Library. And the John Hay Library has a phenomenal Lincoln collection. Mm -hmm. uh, John Hay had been Lincoln's personal uh, assistant personal secretary during his White House years and had written with his uh, fellow White House secretary, John G. Nicolay, a 10 volume, 10 volume biography of Lincoln. It's more, really more a history of the Lincoln administration. Um, and, uh, and his research notes, his diary that he kept when he was uh, in the White House, um, all kinds of uh, valuable material was in the, the papers of John Hay. And then John D. Rockefeller Jr., 
who had graduated from Brown, then bought one of the most important Lincoln collections. There were, at the turn of the century, um, the turn of the 20th century, there were five major collectors and he bought one of the collections mm -hmm. and donated the Brown Library to the John Hay Library. Um, and so, it, it, and, and the librarians at Brown had very lovingly and carefully indexed and mm. cataloged and arranged those papers so that it was really easy to do research there. And Providence is, is about an hour away from New London. So I would teach classes first thing in the morning um, and then zoom off to Providence and practice. <laughs> I was there so much, I was afraid they were going to charge me rent. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and the very first day I was there, uh, I made a startling discovery. Uh, I went to the card catalog. Now, you're too young to remember what a card catalog is, but um, uh, they existed in the, those days before the internet. And I, I had a very sophisticated research design. I, I went to the card catalog and to the drawer marked L. And I pulled out the drawer uh, with uh, three by five cards uh, and uh, went to Lincoln and started to flip through the three by five cards. And I was all of a sudden astounded because time and again, you would see a, a three by five card where the headline would be interview with so-and-so. And I knew that was an important friend of Lincoln's. Um, but, and, and I knew uh, that there were, there were very valuable interviews that had been conducted by Lincoln's law partner, William Herndon. Now I had seen all the Herndon interviews. They weren't published then, but uh, well, they were published in a pretty, inadequate edition and spotty edition, but I had gone, I had used the microphone version um, at, at Connecticut College. You get it from the Library of Congress. And so I knew who, uh, the identity of all the people that Herndon had interviewed, but to hear all these people who are prominent people, I thought, holy mackerel. And they had been interviewed by Nicolay, um, some of them 10 years after the assassination, some 12 and, and so on. Uh, and it was full of really interesting information. So I, right. I, I got the librarians to, to give each one of those interviews. They were, holy mackerel. Uh, and, uh, and it turned out that Nicolay and Hay, when they did their 10-volume biography, had these interviews uh, at their disposal, but they decided not to use them mm. because they had exclusive access to the, uh, to the papers of Abraham Lincoln. That is, Robert Todd Lincoln was very friendly with them. And he said, you, you can have exclusive access to my father's papers, which would be all of his, his incoming mail, the drafts of his letters, uh, drafts of speeches, uh, and, and so forth. And, and historians prefer to do research from original sources rather than right. relying on rem reminiscences. Well, as you well know, having done your, your excellent uh, work with, with J. Edward Murr and in the interviews that he conducted in Indiana in the 1890s, and uh, I'm looking forward to the publication of that book, which is do it later this year. Is that That's the, right? Yep. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Um, um, in any event, so historians are reluctant to use interview materials because people's memories are not always trustworthy. Uh, as Mark Twain once said, the older I get, the more vividly I remember things that never happened. <laughs> uh, and so, so you have to use uh, reminiscences with care, but if you use them in conjunction with original documents, um, you get a sense of who's reliable, who's unreliable, what story makes sense and jibes with original source materials and the like. And it's, it's a judgment call, but uh, if, if you're really familiar with the contemporary documents, that, that, that helps. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, so I thought, my goodness, these are really fantastic sources of new information. I, I didn't expect to add any new information to my book. Uh, my book was, uh, as I envisioned it at first, was going to be uh, some new interpretations of Lincoln's inner life, but uh, without any real new factual information. Mm -hmm. But here all of a sudden, boom, I found a whole bunch. And I thought, my goodness. So it occurred to me then that, um, that a lot of, of Lincoln's early biographers uh, con conducted interviews with people who had known Lincoln or whose parents had known Lincoln uh, and they had a lot of information in their notes and some of that information got into their books but publishers are notorious for telling you to cut that book down and compact that snowball right. and, and the, the, my 
publisher for my uh, Lincoln biography, the big one, uh, was merciless in confining me to 2,000 pages. Um, and so I thought, well, I'll, I'll look at the uh, research notes of other early biographers like William E. Barton, um, and Ida Tarbell, and Albert J. Beveridge, uh, Carl Sandburg, uh, 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 and people of that sort. Uh, right. And, my, yeah. my sense of your career is, is, is really you did make a name for yourself early on by publishing some of these primary and secondary source materials. I mean, you, you just have a treasure trove of them. I couldn't even, you probably may know the number. I couldn't even count the number. And that eventually led to the inner world of Lincoln and then eventually the, right. the green monster, as you like to call it. Um, is that a fair assumption? You sort of made a name for yourself and, and really well, got your well, arms I, around things through that. Well, I, actually, the, the inner world came out first. Okay. Then and then, I, then, then, then I, I discovered so much. So, so those interviews that I was discovered at Brown that, on that first day of, of original research, I thought, geez, that ought to be a, a book. And so that was right. my second book. Uh, and then John Hay's diary, which had been published back in the 1930s, I discovered uh, a typescript of it that had been done much more scrupulously uh, at Brown, but um, hadn't been published, that there were plans to publish it, and it all that fell through for some reason. And so I got in touch with the editor, and uh, who was retired from the Brown Library, and I said, I, I would like to publish your version of the diary with my annotations and an introduction. Um, would that be okay? And he said, sure. So then the Hay Diary came out. And then I discovered that Hay had written a lot of uh, anonymous journalism when he was in the White House mm. um, and scrapbooks of his own writing. So I decided to publish those. <laughs> and then his letters written from the White House during the war. So I decided to publish those. And then his, and Nicolay, his coadjutor, um, had written letters to his fiance from the White House all during the war. So I thought, well, I'll publish those. Um, and uh, so I did a lot, lot of those, and it was so exciting to find new information. I wanted to share it with people. Um, uh, and so I did a bunch of those, and then I thought somebody ought to take all this stuff and do a big new biography. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe Mark Neely will do it, or maybe Jim McPherson, or any of a number, Gabor Borat, or a number of people who were well-established Lincoln scholars. And none of them were foolhardy, and uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to, to undertake it. So I thought, well, what the heck? I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, and so that's how the big book came about. Um, and how long did it take you to, to finish the Cradle of the Grave biography? Well, the Cradle of the Grave biography, I, I signed a contract for it in 97 and delivered the manuscript finally, the final manuscript, the final pages of the index in, uh, in 08. And then it came out very late in 08. Um, and so uh, it was then 11 years, but it, a lot of the research that I had done earlier for the inner world and then for the various editions of the primary source materials all, all fed into it. Um, right. So it's hard to say uh, how much time actually went into it, but, but I was very lucky. Um, I was a, a philanthropist who's, who's an extremely generous um, uh, supporter of Lincoln studies. Uh, um, had offered to help subsidize my work on, on the book out of the blue. I, I never met him, but he had read the, apparently read the inner world and seen some of the uh, hay diary and hay letters and all that sort of thing. Um, and very generously volunteered to underwrite my work. And, and so uh, I was able to retire uh, at the mm -hmm. age of 59 and devote seven years uninterrupted. Wow. Um, when, when, I, when, I had, when I had signed the contract, to do the book back in 97, it was all due by Lincoln's bicentennial, which is 09. Um, and I was still teaching at Connecticut College and I was making progress on the book uh, on weekends and vacations, uh, evenings, but I wasn't making enough progress to meet that deadline. And then when this, this extremely generous offer came along, uh, I combined that with an early retirement package and was able to devote seven years day in and day out and, and to go all over the country um, and do research. And one of the things about doing Lincoln research uh, is that you have to spend not just a lot of time in uh, Washington, although the Library of Congress is, is the premier spot and, and the National Archives, uh, but right. a, and a lot of time in Springfield um, uh, or in Providence. But as, as you can testify, you have to spend a lot of time in Indiana. So I spent a lot of time in your uh, city in Evansville, uh, the various libraries, um, which is sort of the side benefit, right? I mean, it's a beautiful place. <laughs> <I know. laughs> right. you're, you're the world, join the army right. and see the world. Right. 
<laughs> and so, and, and you have to go all over the place because if a, um, if a senator, say from uh, New Hampshire, uh, has a lot of correspondence, some of which deals with Lincoln, it, it will, oftentimes it won't wind up in one of the m more obvious places. It'll wind up in the New Hampshire Historical Society. Mm -hmm. Or his children will have the papers and they've moved to Santa Monica. <laughs> it's, it's in right. California. Uh, and, and so you really have to traipse all around the country. And I was lucky at that time because I had no teaching obligations. Um, and, and my better half to be was very uh, uh, amenable to my um, being away for long stretches. She, she put up with a lot of uh, uh, absences um, and uh, that helped. Um, and so um, I was able to, 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 do, to, to find all kinds of new stuff. I was just, I was just astounded at how much material was out there. Um, and it, it's very painstaking work. Uh, it's easy to find letters that Lincoln wrote. Mm -hmm. They're published by the Abraham Lincoln, most of them are published by Abraham it's pretty easy to find letters that Lincoln received there at the Library of Congress and that they were microfilmed and then they've subsequently been put online. Um, uh, but to find correspondence and diaries which mention Lincoln, for, for example, like a, a, an Ohio senator might uh, go to the White House, speak with the president, then write to his wife or his law partner or his political associate saying, I, I saw the president today, this is what he looked like and this is what he said. Well, finding letters like that really requires a lot of sifting. You have to, these right. manuscript collections are often full of a lot of constituent mail that doesn't have anything to do with the president. But if you sift enough, uh, you'll oftentimes find nuggets. And I found a lot of nuggets that way. Um, and, and, and you were writing at a time really when the internet, Google was coming of age. And so, but, you, but not quite, and even now, obviously all the, re to your point, you know, you can't rely on that solely. You need to go to the primary source, but especially then you still needed to do that. So um, right. and, really and, but, a lot of travel involved. Right. But one of the great things that's happened in recent years, thanks to the internet, is not just the availability of some manuscript collections like the Lincoln Papers, the Library of Congress, uh, uh, which have been uh, mounted online and transcribed, at least the half of them, at least mm -hmm. the, the more important half, and, and word searchable. So that's, that's phenomenal. Um, and there have been a lot of other manuscript collections that have been put online so that you don't have to traipse around to all these repositories uh, but they're all them but but a lot of them aren't yet uh, mm -hmm. and even those that are are not digitized and word searchable so there's a fair amount of work but what's really changed uh, Lincoln research since I finished the big book uh, is that the number of newspapers that are available on databases that are word searchable has dramatically increased mm -hmm. I used some of them when I was doing my big book but um, but there, there are many, many, many more now. And, and uh, so it, it's, it's a godsend. It's really, everything I've written uh, needs to be updated. <laughs> uh, because of the newspapers, yeah. yeah. Because, of, because of what's available in newspapers now. It's just, just astounding. Well, I, one thing I really love about your scholarship is, is you avoid the temptation of overly relying or over relying on uh, New York newspapers because I think there are too many people who do that. It's, they're, they're available and you think, hey, the New York newspapers are the papers of record at the time. They're going to cover everything. And it's just not true. They have a particular perspective and often particular data and facts to work with. And I think the papers in Ohio or Indiana or the South are, are just, as, uh, just as valuable and important to take a look at. Well, that's, that's one of the assumptions I worked on when, uh, worked with when I was doing the big book is that newspaper research on microfilm, which was the, the preferred technique before the Internet made so many of them available, um, and which could be done in, in New London. I, I, through interlibrary loan, you can get these news and you sit down and you turn the crank. It's, it, it's, it's somewhat tedious work. But I, 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 I followed up on just what you were saying. I said, look, New York newspapers are the ones that almost everybody uses. And that's not entirely irrational because the New York papers had the most money. Therefore, right. they had the largest staff of correspondence. Um, uh, and so that, that made sense. And the New York Times at those, uh, was, was indexed, sort of, it was a, a mm -hmm. somewhat imperfect index, but it was indexed. But then I thought, if you were a, an Iowa congressman or senator or general or whatever, and you went to the White House, and then you uh, came out, were you, you going to talk to the New York Times, the New York Herald, the New York Tribune? Uh, no, you were going to talk to uh, the uh, Des Moines Buckeye. Right. Uh, and you, so you really have to go to those papers. Uh, and I, there I found a great deal of new information, even without the help of the internet, but with the help of uh, the miracle of, of uh, microfilm, which seemed like a miracle back in the old days.
I'd be interested to hear uh, some of the new sources that, that you found that caught your attention. I know one of them was a speech Frederick Douglass gave in New York um, on June 1st, 1865. Um, and then another speech I think you found in some of the Douglass papers from December 1865 about Lincoln, quote, rail splitting on black voting rights. Um, right. of, of what all the, yeah. Go ahead. Of all the discoveries I made in manuscript collections, uh, the most dramatic were those two uh, items you mentioned. In the Frederick Douglass papers at the Library of Congress, uh, in the manuscript division, I saw them in the, the not not in uh, online, but in, in the original. Uh, there was a folder that said Lincoln. I said, "Hello." <laughs> <So> <laughs> <I went> to, <laughs> uh, and uh, there was this this phenomenal speech that was delivered, as you say, on June first, eighteen sixty-five, which was the last full day of mourning uh, for Lincoln. Uh, and it was a speech delivered in Cooper Union in New York, which was the premier spot in the country to give a speech. And it was covered in the New York newspapers, not verbatim, but there were, there were accounts mm -hmm. of it. Uh, but it, it said something uh, quite striking. Because I was reading along, it said, uh, Frederick Douglass tells his audience at Cooper Union, Abraham Lincoln was emphatically the black man's president, the first to rise above the prejudice of his time and his country. By inviting me, Frederick Douglass, to consult with him on matters of state, he was saying, by that gesture, I am the president of the black man as well as the white, and I intend to honor his rights as a man and a citizen. I thought, holy mackerel, because everybody who writes on Lincoln and race is familiar with the speech that Frederick Douglass delivered in 1876 at the dedication of a Lincoln statue in Washington. And in that speech, which is very widely reproduced and uh, widely cited, uh, Frederick Douglass said, Abraham Lincoln was preeminently the white man's president, preeminently the white man's president. And we black people were only his stepchildren. And I thought, wait a minute, emphatically the black man's president, preeminently the white man's president, what's going on here? And I said, how could I have missed this speech? Because uh, the papers of Frederick Douglass had been published by uh, the Yale University Press, that is the speeches of Douglass, mm -hmm. uh, and in a big five volume edition that appeared in the 1990s. And it, it's, it's a very valuable asset. It's carefully indexed and, and, and scrupulously done uh, with accurate transcriptions, but it doesn't contain that June 1st speech. I couldn't believe it. Um, and so I wrote to the people at Yale and said, uh, how is it that this remarkable speech uh, didn't make it into your five volume edition? And I, I received no response. Mm. Uh, and then I, I, I phoned and left a message, no response. Well, those of us who went to Princeton aren't surprised that Yale would conduct itself in this fashion, but <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, and then the, the, as you mentioned, there was another speech that, uh, uh, and in Douglas's handwriting, and Douglas in the same folder, that was pretty clearly delivered uh, very late in 1865, say December. Um, and in that remarkable speech, Frederick Douglass said that I heard Lincoln give his last public address, very important, in which he publicly, for the first time, called for black voting rights. Uh, he said that uh, blacks should be allowed to vote. This was in, applied to Louisiana, but presumably uh, for the rest Everywhere. of the country. Oh, right. uh, that uh, black people should be allowed to vote, um, at least those who have served in the armed forces, and those who are very intelligent, by which we assume he meant literate. And I thought, uh, and, and Douglas goes on to say, uh, I and other abolitionists were disappointed in that speech because even though we were heartened to be sure by the fact that he was publicly for the first time in, uh, endorsing black voting rights, he did it in such a modest scale, a limited scope that we were disappointed. But Douglas says in his December speech, he says, we should have known that that was a really important speech because Abraham Lincoln learned his statesmanship in the school of rail splitting. And to split a rail, you take a wedge and you insert the thin edge of the wedge into the log. Then you take a giant maul, the hammer, and you drive home the thick edge of the wedge and you split the log. And we should have known that what Lincoln was doing on that day, on April 11th, 1865, by publicly announcing 
his support for limited black suffrage was inserting the thin edge of the wedge. Mm -hmm. And once he had done that, we should have known you could count on him to drive home the thick edge of the wedge, because that's just what he had done with regard to slavery. Starts off very modestly, suggesting uh, early in the war that uh, Congress should uh, appropriate money to help uh, the border slave states of Kentucky, Missouri, Indiana, uh, and Maryland um, to uh, have their state legislatures abolish slavery and the federal government would compensate the slave owners through federal funds. And that would overcome one of the most uh, troublesome objections to emancipation, at least objections raised by the slaveholders. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the thin edge of the wedge. Uh, uh, and then that doesn't work. That is, um, and he bends over backwards three times. He begs the representatives, congressional delegations from those states to go back home and tell their legislatures, take advantage of this option, this very generous offer, uh, because the war is going to, by, very, by its very friction and abrasion, is going to eliminate slavery. And at least you could get some compensation. But if you, if you sit on your hands, um, you're going to get no compensation. Um, and, and Lincoln then tries very hard uh, and then finally gives up, he throws up his hands and says, these people are incorrigible and they, they are unamenable to reason and common sense. And so then he says, I'm going to issue an Emancipation Proclamation. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so then uh, he does announce that he's uh, issuing an Emancipation Proclamation, which will only apply to the Confederate States and only apply to those parts of the Confederate States which are still in rebellion. Mm -hmm. They occupied areas of Virginia and Louisiana and Arkansas and South Carolina and so forth. The Emancipation Proclamation won't apply because the justification for its constitutionality is that it's a war measure to help right. subdue the rebels. And, and the people in Alexandria, Virginia are already subdued and, and similarly in right. Missouri and elsewhere. So anyway, so, so um, the Emancipation Proclamation, the, the wedge goes a little deeper, that is, uh, slavery within the Confederate states, most of them, uh, most all of the territory in the Confederate states will be abolished. But then that doesn't apply to the border states, to Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, and Missouri. Then, then Lincoln moves a step further uh, by endorsing uh, the 13th Amendment and working hard to get Congress to uh, pass the 13th Amendment, uh, which, was, which part of Lincoln's story is told uh, so um, graphically in the movie Lincoln, a Steven Spielberg movie. Um, so, and, and then that, that abolishes slavery throughout the country. So the mm -hmm. thin edge, the thicker edge, the thicker and the thicker. And, and Frederick Douglass makes that argument. Um, and that's, that's really important. Uh, and I think it's, it's a brilliant argument and a, and a nice image. Um, but it turns out there was one member of that audience in uh, Washington on April 11th, 1865, who did realize how significant Lincoln's speech was uh, the, particularly the portion that called for black voting rights. Uh, and that was a charismatic young actor named John Wilkes Booth. Mm -hmm. And Booth turned to his companions, that is people that he had recruited to help kidnap Lincoln and some plots that fizzled uh, earlier, um, and turns to his companions and says, that means nigger citizenship, that's the last speech he's ever going to give, by God, I'm going to run him through. And three days later, Booth kills Lincoln, not because he issued the Emancipation Proclamation and not because he endorsed the 13th Amendment and helped get it through Congress, but because he called for black voting rights. And therefore, I think it's appropriate for us in the 21st century to regard Lincoln as a martyr to black civil rights, voting mm -hmm. rights, as much as Martin Luther King or Medgar Evers or any of those people who were murdered back in the 1960s as they championed the civil rights revolution of that era. Mm -hmm. You know, one of our early guests on this Lincoln Log podcast is David Blight, who's one of, one of the leading historians of Frederick Douglass. I'm, and I wish I would have asked him this, but I'm curious to what degree your finds on the, these Frederick Douglass papers uh, were incorporated or used by David Blight in his book. Well, you was, know, or have I, you checked them? He, he doesn't really deal with them. I was a little dis disappointed. Oh. It's a very good book in many ways. Uh, he's found a lot of new sources, um, mm -hmm. and he's a very gifted historian. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was, and, and he starts off the book with a, a, a long description of Douglas's 1876 speech on the occasion in which it was delivered, um, uh, and uh, it's admirably done. But I, I, I was disappointed not to see some discussion of well, this this contrasts rather sharply with the 1865 speech that he gave uh, as right. a eulogy for Lincoln, um, and so. Uh, 
But I do I have great respect for that book and, and for uh, David White as a historian. I'm just a little disappointed that, that those two speeches weren't more uh, heavily emphasized or acknowledged. For, for somebody who um, reads your biography, what might surprise folks the most if they haven't already read it? What would they find most surprising in, in terms of how both about Lincoln generally or how you um, okay. handle the biography? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think one of the things that uh, surprised me uh, was um, Lincoln's uh, anonymous journalism. Mm. That we, we know from uh, William Herndon, Lincoln's law partner, for 16 years that, um, that he, William Herndon and Lincoln, both wrote anonymous contributions, op-ed pieces we call them today, for the local uh, Whig newspaper, which became the Republican newspaper in Springfield. And according to uh, Herndon and according to people that Herndon interviewed, uh, Lincoln and he contributed uh, scores and scores of pieces to the paper. Uh, and nobody had ever made an attempt systematically to identify which pieces were by Lincoln. And so I, I tried to do that um, uh, because there are about a dozen that most people would agree with are by Lincoln. Uh, they're not signed by but Lincoln acknowledged one. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's pretty clear that, that about 10 or 11 others are, are by Lincoln. And there are certain characteristics of the style and the approach and the tone uh, in those pieces which gives you a kind of rough yardstick for measuring other uh, pieces in the paper. And so using that rough yardstick identified um, um, many, many pieces that I thought were pretty clearly by Lincoln. And th this is very important because uh, th these were many uh, written in the 1830s and 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't know much about what Lincoln said in the 1830s and 40s because stenographic uh, reporting of Lincoln's utterances, public utterances, didn't exist. It's only in the 1850s that we start to get uh, shorthand accounts, verbatim accounts of what Lincoln said. Use the 1830s and 40s, and even in the 18, early 1850s, uh, the accounts of Lincoln's speeches go like this. Uh, in the Whig papers and the Republican papers, Lincoln gave a brilliant speech and everybody loved it. In the Democratic papers, Lincoln gave a terrible speech and everybody hated it. But you don't know what he said. Right. Um, now, we do, uh, th we do have a handful of speeches, which are important, uh, but uh, there's an awful lot of ground that's not covered. Uh, and so if, if I'm accurate in identifying these pieces, and I'm, I'm careful to say, although it's stylistically very clumsy, very clumsy um, in, in the book, I say, uh, this piece that appeared in the Illinois State Journal, probably by Lincoln, or in all likelihood by Lincoln, because uh, you have to qualify. You can't say it's definitely, except when Lincoln himself identified it. Um, as his handiwork on the one occasion. Um, and wh what it shows is that Lincoln was a low road politician or part of, part of Lincoln's early career, that is in right. his 20s and 30s, was pretty low, low road stuff. That he was very gifted at uh, ridiculing and pouring sarcasm over Democrats. He was a Whig uh, and, uh, and so he was, uh, and he was a master of a really cutting sarcasm and ridicule. Now he didn't invent that form of discourse. That was common practice in 19th century journalism, particularly where he was uh, active uh, in, in Illinois. Uh, but he was exceptionally good at it. In fact, he would, in debate sometime, he would ridicule his opponents so badly that they would be, they would be unmanned, they would be weeping um, because of the cutting nature of his sarcasm and and one of the, the one piece that he did write for the paper uh that he did acknowledge the authorship of uh led to a duel a near duel uh, he had insulted the um uh a, a democratic uh mm -hmm. state treasurer and and uh the guy was a, a hot-blooded irishman uh, james shields and he challenged lincoln to a duel and lincoln accepted and it, it came within an ace of occurring and it was eventually called off um and uh, so anyway, so one of the surprising things to me about Lincoln in his, in his 20s and his 30s was how often he took a low road approach to politics. Um, now, as I say, that was, that was fairly common practice for his uh, fellow Whigs. But one of the things that particularly struck me was in 1836 and in 1840 in the presidential elections, uh, if I'm right, Lincoln's op-ed pieces uh, engaged in race baiting. 
I, I was mm. taken aback. Now, if you, if you go to the collected works and look at the uh, accounts of Lincoln's speeches in uh, 1836 and 1840, which again are very sketchy and, and, right. and, and really have very little of the substance. But in one of the speeches, he condemns uh, the incumbent president in 1840, Martin Van Buren, for having supported limited black suffrage uh, at the New York State Constitutional Convention in the 1820s. And therefore, you shouldn't vote for Martin Van Buren because he's, he supported black voting rights, uh, limited black voting rights. Um, and uh, and he, so, so we have one official version of that in, in the collected works. But then if I'm right, he used that again and again and again and again in 1836 when Van Buren was running for president the first time. Uh, and then again uh, in 1840. Uh, but not just in that one, one occasion. If you read through the collected works, you think, oh, well, Lincoln, you know, he's went off the... Of, Got, got right. sidetracked a little bit with this this low argument, but but if I'm right, he played that a lot. Now, you have to understand that that was a standard Whig argument. <laughs> a lot of Whigs made that argument, um, and it also should be borne in mind that the Democrats were using a counter argument that the Whigs were too soft on abolitionism and too soft on blacks and all that. Uh, so the race card was played by both sides. Mm -hmm. But if I'm right, Lincoln really played it pretty heavily and pretty often. Uh, and uh, so, I, and I was a little surprised that when the book came out, more wasn't made of that. Um, uh, but and and it, it, it's it's one of the least credible uh, creditable um, aspects of Lincoln's early mm. political career. Uh, but to my way of thinking, what the the larger significance of it is that it makes his journey from that point to the point where he calls for limited black suffrage and gets murdered for doing so just makes his his progression even uh, more, more impressive remarkable. yeah yeah uh, and 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 for connoisseurs of irony it's it's noteworthy that abraham lincoln condemns martin van buren for supporting limited blank suffrage and the limit was that blacks who owned 250 dollars worth of property which was practically no blacks in new york could vote so right so, uh, there's uh, this tiny little uh fraction of the black population was was enfranchised um uh, so it was so Van Buren was uh, supporting limited black voting rights. So Lincoln condemns him, and then Lincoln gets murdered <laughs> years later for endorsing black uh, limited black voting rights. Uh, Would you say uh, the White House years for Lincoln were grief grief filled? I mean, he had personal depression himself. He had the weight of the war, obviously. Um, the lost Willie, and then he's got struggles in his marriage with Mary Todd. So we believe um, it just seems like an incredibly grief filled time for him. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. The, the White House, as John Hay put it, was not a very happy place during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. When you consider the, the burden of responsibility that Lincoln had and the, the, the deaths of, and nobody, but almost nobody anticipated that there would be over 700,000 deaths as a result of the mm -hmm. war. Uh, that would be like having uh, a war today uh, in which uh, 3 million uh, people right. were killed. Uh, and um, and, you know, and so, so the number of men killed during the, the Civil War uh, is greater than the number of men killed in all the other wars in American history combined. It's astounding. Um, and so Lincoln obviously felt very responsible um, for that, and that was a crushing burden. Um, then he's, and his children, well, the Lincolns had four children, all boys, mm -hmm. um, which has to make you a little sympathetic to Mrs. Lincoln. I didn't have a daughter and, and four boys. Right. That's a, um, and, uh, and the favorite of both the president and Mrs. Lincoln uh, was Willie, uh, who was the third born. Uh, he was the one who looked most like Lincoln, who had Lincoln's sense of humor, who had Lincoln's temperament. Uh, um, unlike Robert, Robert, uh, the first born, who was the only one to survive into adulthood, mm -hmm. uh, was, uh, was not very temperamentally or uh, physically uh, akin to his father. Uh, and and Mrs. Lincoln then refers to Willie after his death as as their favorite. So so she's very she's very upfront about it. Um, right. And it's it's considered uh, um, impolite <laughs> in, in modern <coughs> in modern times to admit that you have a favorite child. Um, but as somebody once said, everybody denies they have a favorite child and everybody lies. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, Lincoln then loses Willie, who was his, uh, 11 years old and, and a kid who was a real source of pleasure. Um, 
uh, to him. Um, and his, his son, Tad, was, was uh, uh, somebody that he, he was extremely fond of, but didn't, Tad was what we would call today learning disabled and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and an adorable rascal in some ways, but he wasn't the same kind of almost clone that Willie had been. So to lose uh, Willie was a terrible blow. Um, then Robert, um, with whom he wasn't particularly close, was off uh, at uh, uh, college at that time at, 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 Har at Harvard. Uh, so he didn't see much of him. And then Mrs. Lincoln uh, was a great source of, of difficulty uh, for Lincoln. She was extreme. Link Lincoln tells, um, uh, oh, oh, and when you asked me what, what discovery did I make that was particularly noteworthy, um, uh, um, I discovered in the published version of the diary of Orville Browning. Orville Browning was a good friend of Lincoln's. He was a fellow lawyer. They had served together in the Illinois State Legislature. Uh, Browning became a senator during the Civil War. He officiated, or, or he was arra he arranged the, the funeral uh, for Willie. Um, uh, he visited the White House often. He kept a diary. And, and it's, it was published back in uh, volume one in the 20s and volume two in the 30s. And it's an extremely valuable source of Lincoln's statements and uh, descriptions of Lincoln and, and his mood and all that. Uh, and I remember the, the first time I read it, I said, um, I noticed that there were six passages deleted. Uh, if you go through the diary, you'll see um, passage deleted because of reference to Mrs. Lincoln. I thought, hmm, wow. And so I thought, I've, I've got to go see those because one of the chapters in my first book was, dealt with a marriage and it turned out to be right. the biggest chapter. Um, and so I hastened out to Springfield and said, <clears throat> Ahem, could I please see the Browning diary in manuscript form? And they say, no. I said, what? <laughs> and they said, when, when we purchased this very valuable document from uh, Browning's descendant, uh, she insisted, that is the descendant, that uh, the passages about Mrs. Lincoln not be published and not be shown to anybody. And the librarians were somewhat reluctant to do that. As, uh, you do, you, if you accept something, I'll buy something, you, you want to have right. available, uh, all of it available to the public and to scholars and students. And so um, uh, I said, oh, well, and then I thought to myself, you know what? I'll bet you some of the early biographers of Lincoln uh, actually saw those passages and in their notes, I'll bet you that there, there's some, some of those six passages will show up. Mm -hmm. And so I ransacked the Carl Sandburg papers at, um, uh, at the University of Illinois in uh, Champaign-Urbana. It's a huge collection uh, and uh, didn't find it. Uh, uh, and then I ransacked the papers of other uh, historians. Um, and then one day I was at the um, uh, University of Chicago going through the papers of a, of a Lincoln scholar named William e. Barton. And, uh, and I found a lot of good material for my book, uh, but not anything from the Browning diary. And as I was leaving after several days work there, uh, the manuscript head said, well, did you find everything you were looking for? I said, well, I found a lot of really good stuff, very important. This is, uh, you've, you've, you've done a real service in preserving this material and making it available. But there's something I was really looking for that um, I, I didn't find. And he said, well, you know, we got 10 more boxes of this stuff that are unprocessed. And I said, really? <laughs> That's like saying, yeah. sweet, big. <laughs> I thought, all right. And so I dove in and lo and behold, I found one of the diary entries. Uh, and it, 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 uh, Browning uh, describes how he's meeting with David Davis, uh, a, a friend, um, and also Lincoln's uh, very, very close friend uh, at the bar. And then... Uh, uh, Lincoln appoints him to the United States Supreme Court, and Davis knew Lincoln very well. He had been you know, his close political. He'd been his campaign manager, in effect, in 1860. He had been the judge at uh, all the, the many of the court cases that Lincoln presided or that, that participated in on the circuit, um, and was a um, um, very close to him. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so Browning says to Lincoln, um, I mean, he says to. Uh, uh, to David Davis, he says, now th this biography of Lincoln that's just appeared, published by, uh, under the authorship of, uh, supposed authorship of Ward Hill Lamon, our friend, um, it, it says um, that among other things, Mrs. Lincoln, uh, upon leaving the White House, took away a lot of stuff that really didn't belong to her, that belonged to the public. 
Uh, and but we know that Mrs. Lincoln was difficult, but um, uh, but that's surely exaggerated. And David Davis says, no, no, no. Uh, and Davis was the administrator of the Lincoln estate. So he had some inside information about what's what. Uh, and he said, no, no, no. All those stories are true. She, stealed, uh, she stole stuff from the White House out of her insatiable need to steal. She was a natural born thief. Yeah. Holy mackerel. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. And then I happened to mention that. Um, at some question and answer session in Springfield, not long thereafter, uh, and a newspaper re a reporter from the, the local newspaper, the State Journal Register, was uh, there, and and he just he had been nice to me, and so so he came up and, and asked me more about that, and I said, well, here here it is, and so he published it, uh, and it made something of a sensation, uh, and then then the the uh, Abraham Frank Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum then shortly thereafter released all of the. Uh, six mm. messages uh, and most of them come from the war years themselves in which mrs lincoln uh is shown to be padding payrolls and padding expense accounts and pinching the salary of white house you know, employees mm -hmm. and engaging in all kinds of really unethical behavior um wow. and, uh, and then i found another thing about browning uh that those those interviews that i mentioned earlier at, at brown um uh, one of the interviews was Browning, and, and Browning says, and this is in 1875, so it's 10 years after the assassination, Browning tells Nicolay in this interview that uh, I, several times in the White House when I was visiting Lincoln, he told me about his domestic woes and how he was constantly terrified that his wife would to do something that would bring him into disgrace. Now Lincoln almost never talked to, to anybody about his marriage. Mm -hmm. um, but, but Browning, here's, and we know from the Browning diary that he saw a lot of him and, and uh, thought, holy mackerel. Um, and so, uh, so Lincoln's um, uh, ordeal as president and his, his, his sorrow and, and his depression uh, were exacerbated by his marriage. Uh, that uh, instead of having a wife who could, he could fight and console and could uh, be nurturant and supportive and all that, uh, was in fact um, uh, a, a hindrance uh, and a source of embarrassment and anxiety rather than a helpmate. Uh, mm. and, 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 the and then there's tons of evidence about this from lots and lots of other sources, not just in Springfield, but in Washington as well. And, and so I've just finished a book about the Lincoln marriage. Um, and uh, uh, I, I point out, as, as I pointed out in my earlier writings, that Mrs. Lincoln is more to be pitied than censured that the Almighty ladles out a fair amount of misery on all human plates, but her portion was particularly heaping. Mm -hmm. That is to say, she lost her mother when she was six, and that's tough, that's awful. Or Lincoln lost his mother when he was nine, and that's, that's a hard blow, but we're not told to learn to lose your mother at six, and then to have your father immediately marry another uh, a woman, um, so you get a stepmother within a year or so, uh, and who's unsympathetic to you. Uh, mm -hmm. And who tells her husband, don't pay any attention to those six children you had by that dead woman, but pay attention to the nine children we're going to have. And they did. Um, and so uh, poor Mary is then, her mother, uh, is a, and, and children tend to regard the early death of a parent as a deliberate act of abandonment. Mm. It's crazy, but that's the way kids think apparently. Um, and so she feels abandoned by her mother. And then her father, in order to placate his new wife, tunes out Mary and her siblings in order to pay attention to the new batch of children that he's siring. Mm -hmm. uh, but she feels abandoned emotionally by her father, even though he's, he's a well-to-do figure in Kentucky and supports her with education and clothes and comfortable home and all that. But emotionally, she feels abandoned. Um, uh, then, uh, when she's married, she has four children. Three of them die before they reach adulthood. And even by the standards of the 19th century, that's an unusually high percentage. Uh, that's a terrible set of blows. Um, she also seemed to suffer from, uh, pretty clearly suffered from manic depression. And that's usually something you inherit. That, that's genetically based. And so you don't, you don't ask to inherit the manic depression. Right. She, she t also had terrible migraine headaches. And migraine headaches are no fun. No fun. And they, they, they make you vomit. They make you <laughs> right. light. And it's terrible to have migraine headaches and she had those pretty regularly. Uh, she also had terrible premenstrual problems and, and menstrual problems which which 
uh, uh, even in one letter she refers to. Um, uh, she has her husband gets murdered at his side, at her side, at the peak of his fame and fortune. Right. And so when you add all that up, you think, "Good Lord, that's really you got to feel sorry for her." Right. So she deserves more to be pitied than censured. However, she made her husband's domestic life very unhappy, and that has to be acknowledged too. Um, so. Well, and maybe if we could chat real briefly about another somewhat controversial topic, uh, or at least becoming more of an interesting debate in the Lincoln community, and that is Lincoln's father, Thomas. Um, yes. You take the common position in the in the Green Monster, as we call it, that Lincoln had a poor relationship with his father, and that his father was something of a shiftless ne'er do well. Um, right. Our mutual friend, who's on the uh, Abraham Lincoln Association board, Dick Hart, is fairly passionate about rehabilitating Thomas's reputation, really? and then uh, <laughs> and then Edward Murr, um, an early Lincoln biographer in Indiana, who we referenced earlier, also takes a positive view of Lincoln. Um, how has your view of the president's father changed, if at all, since the biography was published in 2008? Well, it really hasn't, because uh, there are, I, and, and I have the greatest respect for J. Edward Murr uh, for doing the kind of interviewing he did with, with 11 people who knew Lincoln and then with other people whose parents knew Lincoln. I mean, that's fa very valuable re original source material. Um, uh, and uh, and when, whenever you deal with any controversial subject in history, uh, you have to weigh and balance evidence. Uh, and um, uh, you're going to find evidence you know, oftentimes on both sides of an issue. Was, was uh, Thomas Lincoln a shiftless ne'er-do-well or was, was he an mem upstanding member of the frontier bourgeoisie? Um, uh, and so you, you do have evidence on both sides, but the evidence on the side of, uh, of his shiftlessness uh, is, is very substantial and the evidence on the other side is much less substantial. And so, so uh, this, this reminds me of the old joke about elephant rabbit stew. And to make an evenly balanced stew, you take one elephant, you chop him up and throw it in the pot, and then you take one rabbit and chop it up, and then you have an right. evenly balanced stew. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you take the number of, of uh, sources that describe Thomas Lincoln as a kind of favorable, upstanding member of the frontier bourgeoisie, and then compare it to all these other uh, sources, um, it, it seems to me, to, in fairness, that you have to acknowledge that the, the uh, the shiftless thesis is more important, but ultimately that's unimportant. What really counts is the nature of his relationship with his son Abraham. Um, right. And so, and, and that was very strange. Uh, and, and there's all kinds of evidence to that, including Lincoln's own letter, refusing to come to visit his father on his deathbed. Uh, Lincoln's father was illiterate, and so he couldn't write to his son and say, please come and visit me, I'm dying. But uh, Lincoln's stepbrother lived with uh, their father uh, and writes to Lincoln and says, please come, uh, our father's dying, we'd like to see you now. And Lincoln writes back with a letter in his own handwriting that we still have saying, tell our father that it would be more painful than pleasant if we were to see each other now. And no matter how estranged a child may be from a parent, the imminence of death usually acts as a kind of solvent on that estrangement, but not in Lincoln's case. And then Lincoln doesn't have his grave marked with a tombstone, even though he's the only one with real money in the family. He doesn't name a son after his father until after his father dies. And it was very common in those days to honor your father by naming a son after him. So that the Lincolns have uh, three sons um, born during Thomas Lincoln's lifetime, and none of them is named Thomas. And then after Lincoln's father dies, then, then the fourth son is named Thomas. So Thomas doesn't have the... Uh, uh, satisfaction of knowing that his name will live on. On top of that, when Lincoln writes about his father, it's pretty unflattering. Um, for example, he talks about how he was a poor, wandering, laboring boy without education, and he could only bunglingly sign his own name. And you think, bunglingly? Why do you throw that in? That's rather hostile, uh, unflattering. Um, and so, uh, uh, so, so uh, even if, if, if you are to accept the notion that, that Thomas Lincoln was really a, a, a fine, industrious, upstanding member of the frontier bourgeoisie, uh, that, that's not, and that's, just, that's a very relatively minor matter. What really counts is the nature of his relationship with his son, and, and which I lay very heavy emphasis on. Mm -hmm. um, um, and uh, I, I try to explain why Lincoln hated slavery by suggesting that Lincoln hated the way his father had treated him which was somewhat like a slave. That is to say, 
that when Lincoln was uh, in school as an adolescent, um, and for very brief periods, his total sum of schooling, he said, was less than a, a full year. Right. Uh, his father would yank him out of school and rent him out to neighbors because his father needed money. Um, and so Lincoln would go and work doing backbreaking farm labor, just chopping down trees, digging up stumps, building fences, killing hogs, and, uh, and all that. Um, and he would get maybe 25, 30 cents a day, and he would turn all that money over to his father because that was the law of the land. You weren't the property of your father, that is, your father couldn't sell you, but any money you made uh, belonged to your father. And Thomas Lincoln uh, enforced that law or custom or both. Um, and, uh, and Lincoln seems to have resented that as, as well he might have. And one of the striking things about Lincoln's anti-slavery speeches those wonderful uh, eloquent speeches he gives in the 1850s uh, is that they tend to emphasize one aspect of slavery over and over again to the virtual exclusion of the more traditional and popular arguments. That is the, the cruelty of slavery. He doesn't much talk about the beatings and the whippings and the maimings and all that. Doesn't talk much about the breakup of slave families where husbands were sold away from wives and children were sold away from their parents. Mm -hmm. Doesn't talk much about uh, the suppression of civil liberties, of free speech and freedom of assembly and all that sort of thing be, uh, to placate the slave interests. He doesn't talk about the creation of an aristocratic social order in the South where the planter class really dominated politics and society in a way that was really incompatible with a democratic republic. Instead, he emphasizes again and again, even into the second inaugural, that it's an outrage that the slaveholders have rewritten the word of God Almighty himself who, upon expelling Adam from the Garden of Eden, said that he and his all male descendants uh, would suffer from a curse. In the sweat of thy brow shalt thou eat thy bread. And Lincoln said it's a monstrous sacrilege that the slaveholders have rewritten the word of God Almighty himself to say, in the sweat of somebody else's brow shalt thou eat thy bread. That it's, that it's slavery is, is an organized, systematized robbery. The, mm -hmm. Somebody goes out and works in the hot sun all day, and somebody else derives all the profits. Now, Lincoln didn't invent that argument. He was not the only one to make it, to be sure. But I thought it was noteworthy that he emphasized that so heavily, even, even into the second inaugural. Um, and I thought, I th it occurred to me that, that Lincoln may have uh, felt an identity with the slaves because that was their lot. They work, hot in the hall, and the, they work in the hot sun all day, and then somebody else derives all the profits. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and then Lincoln does write a letter in which he talks about being a slave. He, uh, he had a courtship uh, with a woman uh, to whom he got engaged and then had buyer's remorse, as it were, uh, and, and the, the uh, romance eventually fizzled. And so Lincoln writes a long letter in which he describes this courtship. And he says, uh, after he'd gotten engaged, he says, there is no form of bondage, real or imaginary, that I've ever been in from which I more longed to escape. And so he says, I know what it's like to be a slave. I know what it's like to be in bondage. Um, now that's a metaphor, of course, but I think people use metaphors, um, not just willy nilly, but they oftentimes have a, right. they can reveal what's going on beneath the rational conscious ego's surface. You, so you I, think, I think Lincoln identified with the slaves because of the way his father treated him. You're, like we talked about at the introduction here, you, many would consider you the world's leading authority on Lincoln, but what's one aspect of Lincoln's history you wish you knew more about? Well, uh, uh, the, the aspect, well, I, I would really like to know more about what actually he did say in, in the early mm -hmm. part of his career. Now, because I'm guessing with, with these uh, op-ed pieces, uh, and, but I, I would really love to have that uh, more more firmly established. And one of the projects that I would like to see undertaken um, by you, perhaps, uh, is to um, to look at the, uh, and to take advantage of the uh, much more sophisticated um, computer programs that exist today than they did back in the time when I was writing my book uh, for identifying the authorship of disputed items. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the problems with that is that the, these op-ed pieces that I'm pretty sure are by Lincoln, you can't really compare them to the Gettysburg Address or the Second Inaugural or, or right. any of the big state papers of the presidency. Um, uh, but what you can do is, is take that 
corpus of about a dozen that I've, uh, that most historians, what I think, agree are, are Lincoln's. Tease out whatever you can in some systematic way above and beyond my kind of seat of the pants analysis uh, and then run uh, items through a, a computer program with sufficient uh, sophistication and subtlety that I could, could save them. 80% chance, 90% chance. I, I don't know how they would do that, but th I think that would be the uh, that would be the thing that I would love to see done and and uh, find out for sure whether the uh, kind of low road politician that I described, uh, based in part and large part on those op ed pieces that I think he wrote, uh, whether I actually uh, did uh, accurately uh, mm -hmm. identify those pieces. Uh, switching gears briefly to the Lincoln history community, you've developed a reputation of sorts as a policeman on plagiarism. Do you see it as a problem in the history community or um, uh, no more sort of now than it has been any time in the past? Uh, well, um, uh, <laughs> I did I, way back when I, I stuck my neck out uh, to blow the whistle on a plagiarist and somebody else had blown the whistle originally and I, I came to his uh, support. Defense. Uh, and um, uh, th this was in the days before Google searches, <laughs> so it was really tedious to say, okay, this phrase comes from this source and from that source. Uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, and I told a friend, I said, yeah, uh, when, when the, the uh, flap over uh, um, Steve Ambrose uh, and Doris Kearns, Kearns Goodwin broke, uh, well, um, why why aren't you saying anything about that? Those those nationally uh, notable uh, controversies. And I said, well, I don't want to get identified as a crank on that subject. And my friend said, too late. Too late. <laughs> right. Um, and so I, I think one of the things that makes plagiarism more difficult these days, um, and I think people are more careful, is because of Google searches. You can you can identify it much more easily. Google. Yes. So much easily. And there there were there there were. Uh, um, as, as a college uh, university professor, I did, there, there are uh, uh, programs you can run a student paper through and say, is, is this plagiarized? <coughs> and you, you'll get a report saying, oh, right. Right, this paper comes verbatim from here and that passage verbatim from there with no quotation marks and no footnote. Um, so I think it's probably much less of a problem. Although, um, one of the more disheartening uh, developments in that whole area is that the American Historical Association, which had, at the time I got involved in this controversy, um, had uh, established a, a committee to investigate professional uh, ethics violations, including plagiarism. And I had submitted, and as I, it's, it's a long, complicated story. I've, I've written a book about it, but nobody will publish it, um, called Dishonest Abe Scholarship. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and, so, and, and the plagiarist, in this case, threatened to sue the American Historical Association. And shortly thereafter, they, they said, we're not going to investigate these cases anymore. Right, right. Um, so, uh, but I think the, the, the uh, offsetting that dramatically is the capacity anybody has really to uh, check out plagiarism with the technique of mm -hmm. uh, Google searches. Another question regarding the history community. We have so many wonderful organizations devoted to Lincoln, including the Abraham Lincoln Association, the Abraham Lincoln Institute, and the Lincoln Forum. Do you ever see a time when these various organizations seek to merge or join forces more formally? Or do you think well, sort of they, I, all, they I, all have their own domains and sort of stay where they are? Well, as, as the uh, recently installed president of the Abraham Lincoln <laughs> Association, and they're about to be the president of the Abraham Lincoln Institute, um, which I helped found 23 years ago, whenever right. it was. I would like to see a lot more cooperation. And, and uh, what we get of Google searches like this, I mean, <laughs> Zoom sessions like this. Right. <laughs> uh, right. And one of the things that, that you have been pioneering, and, and bless your heart, is to have the sort of thing that you and I are doing right now done and then posted and made available so that people mm -hmm. who want to know more about Lincoln um, can access them and so that and, and i think what we should do and i think to some extent we do do is all all of those groups that you mentioned the lincoln institute the abraham lincoln association lincoln forum to share information with each other about right. what, what's available and what we put online um and, and links that you can uh use um so um 
it would be my hope that we can have, and, and I can pretty much guarantee that there's going to be a lot closer <laughs> uh, association and connection with the Abraham Lincoln Association and the Abraham Lincoln Institute when I'm president of both of them at the same right, time. Right, right, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to be uh, cognizant of your time and our listeners' time, but sure. um, before we end up here, I'm curious where the focus of your scholarship is these days and what book or books are in your future. Well, I'm, I'm very excited about the project I'm working on now, which is a book about Lincoln's interaction with black people, not, not his speeches and proclamations and, and writings, uh, but how he dealt with black people who mm -hmm. came to, in, in Springfield uh, and in Washington, uh, who came, uh, who, who lived right down the block from Lincoln, say, uh, or, right. or, uh, who, uh, whom he saw regularly in, in Springfield. Um, and uh, there's been some very fine pioneering work done by a lawyer in Springfield named Richard Hart. Um, uh, and I've, I've used his work pretty extensively. Uh, and, but he wrote before the, the revolution of newspaper research uh, through databases and word searchable databases. So I, I've been able to add to the pioneering work he did. And then there's just all kinds of information about how Lincoln was visited in Washington, that black people coming to White House receptions, black people coming to the White House to, to ask for favors, um, and, and how Lincoln responds to them. And thanks to these newspaper databases, there's a lot more information about the event themselves, that is the interaction, but then also the reaction. And one of the striking things about Lincoln's cordiality to black visitors um, is how the Democratic press went ballistic and mm -hmm. denounce them in the most, most vile ways oftentimes. And everybody knows who studies American history at all that in 1901, Theodore Roosevelt, then president, created quite an uproar when he invited a black man to dine at the White House, mm -hmm. Booker T. Washington. Uh, but what's not very well known is that similar uh, uproars occurred, not quite on the scale of, of that uh, episode in 1901, but nonetheless, uh, Lincoln getting an awful lot of criticism for showing any kind of, of, uh, of cordiality uh, or respect to, to black people at, mm -hmm. at, at White House meetings, White House perceptions, uh, and the like. So yeah. it's a story that really reflects a great deal of credit on Lincoln, and it's, it's astounding that it hasn't been told. Now, one of the reasons that it hasn't been told is that, that doing the kind of newspaper research that you can do so easily now uh, wasn't available until relatively recently. But, but right. it's, it's a great story, and, and it sheds an awful lot of light on the question of Lincoln and race. Um, and, um, and so I'm very eager to get that book done. I'm hoping to get that book done by the end of this year. Wonderful. Uh, I guess one final question I like to ask people as we end is, do you, do you have a favorite Lincoln anecdote or story? Um, uh, well, uh, th there, there are several that, <laughs> that come to mind. Um, uh, um, my favorite Lincoln quote, uh, which is, is an anecdote, uh, has to do with a, a, a young Union captain who during the Civil War had been squabbling with his superior officers. And Lincoln took time from his busy schedule to write a very um, avuncular, uh, paternal, wise uh, letter to this young captain. Uh, and in it, he uh, quotes from one of his favorite authors, Shakespeare, and quotes from one of his favorite plays, which is Hamlet, and from the speech that uh, Polonius uh, gives to his son, as his son's about to go off to college. Um, and uh, it's a familiar speech uh, full of chestnuts like, to thine own self be true, and, and neither a borrower nor a lender be. But Lincoln quotes a separate passage from that list of do's and don'ts, uh, which is much less known. And so he says to this young captain, he says, uh, the advice of a father to a son, then quotes Polonius' speech to Laertes, beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear it, that the opposed may beware of thee. Lincoln said, that advice is good and yet not the best. Quarrel not at all. No man determined to make the most of himself can spare time for personal contention. Mm. Still less can he afford to take all the consequences, including the vitiating of his temper and the loss of self-control. Yield larger things to which you can show no more than an equal claim and lesser things, though clearly your own. Mm. 
better to give your path to a dog than be bitten by him in contesting for the right. Even killing the dog would not cure the bite. And this, I think, is an anecdote that, uh, or a quote that really sums up one of Lincoln's most uh, remarkable qualities. That is his unwillingness to take things personally, his unwillingness to quarrel, his unwillingness to uh, take uh, disagreement personally, which was one of the hallmarks of his character, which was one of the things that made him such a successful president mm -hmm. and such an admirable man. Mm. Wonderful story, wonderful story. Well, well, Professor Burlingham, thank you so much for taking time uh, to, to, to do this. Um, um, we, uh, you, like I said, you're, you fit like a glove for this podcast, and obviously, in addition to your work with the uh, Abraham Lincoln Association and your expertise, and so we really appreciate um, you, uh, you sharing your insights. Thank you, Josh, and we really appreciate your uh, pioneering work in getting these podcasts off the ground. All right. Thank you for listening to Lincoln Log. You can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And if you like this podcast, please consider rating it on iTunes and leaving a review. This helps other people find the show.